All right, everyone, welcome back. Today, I have a pelvic physical therapist and board certified women's health specialist on the show with us. So welcome. This is Janelle Howell. She is also known as the vagina rehab doctor, but to me, she is known as the TikTok queen. So welcome, Janelle. <laughs> hey, Callie. I'm so excited to be here. I'm honored for that that title of the TikTok queen because I feel like I struggle on that app. So for you to give me that, that title, I'm so honored, but really excited to get into the conversation about IC today. Absolutely. No, I, I think you're, you're doing a great job. I checked out your profile earlier and you have videos that have over a million views. And I think that is amazing for women's health and the pelvic floor world. Um, just educating people because you make great videos, you know, you use your models, you explain things really well. So I think you're doing a great job. Thank you so much. I'm honored. I'm blushing right now. <laughs> you guys can't see it, but she's blushing. <laughs> yeah. So can you um, let's, uh, just give yourself a brief introduction to the audience, you know, where you're located, how you got involved in pelvic physical therapy? Yeah, sure. So I'm a physical therapist first before I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, and, and what physical therapy is, is just working with people to restore function, right? So if you want to be able to walk, you know, a mile or two without feeling low back pain, or if you were in a car accident and you want to be able to, you know, run again, we help you to get that function back. And in terms of the pelvic floor though, if you want to be able to have sex again without pain, or if you want to be able to jump rope and get on the trampoline without peeing your pants, or if you want to poop without straining, like extremely hard, <laughs> You know, those are the things that we help you to get back to that functional aspect of living. Um, the, the way that I found this path was that um, I always, I knew for a while I wanted to do, to do physical therapy, but um, in physical therapy school, there was a very short abbreviated class on the pelvic floor and women's health. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool and interesting and honestly kind of weird. I was like, ooh, we do what now? And after I got done with school, I, I had to get a job. So I went straight into orthopedics. So the, the general physical therapy. Um, but when I was doing traveling physical therapy, my recruiter told me about a women's health position. And I gave it a try for three months because that's how long your contracts are when you're a traveling healthcare practitioner. Uh, and I loved it so much that I kept renewing my contract for an entire year. So I started off treating bladder dysfunction, which is appropriate for the, for the conversation. Lots of urinary frequency, urgency, incontinence, all of that. And that's what gave me my introduction. And then I specialized. So I went in and did a residency program, got certified as a women's health specialist. And here I am, the vagina rehab doctor. <laughs> there you are. I love that you picked that name for yourself. Thank you so much. It, I really wanted to choose something that was kind of like, oh my gosh. In the beginning, it was so many laughs. They were like, your name is what? And I thought it was important because there's so much secrecy around vaginal health and pelvic floor health. Um, and that doesn't help us get better. If we're ashamed to talk about what we're going through, that's not going to get us closer to you know, living the life that we want to live. So I was like, you know what? If you're going to follow me and learn from me, you're going to get comfortable just saying vagina simply because you're following my account. So that was um, the reasoning behind that. Love that. And I saw on your website, it says your primary audience is called vagina CEOs. So where did that come from? You know, my boyfriend actually came up with that name. <laughs> I love that. He is a law student. And so he's all about making sure everyone feels included, doing the right thing. Um, and and I, so I, I come from a religious background and when I first started my account, I was uneducated on the fact that not everyone identifies as a woman, even if they have a vagina. So I cannot control how someone identifies, right? And I don't want anyone to feel like they're not welcome just by my language. And so I have not gotten rid of the term woman. I am a woman. I know that women <laughs> exist. But I do many times refer to us as vagina CEOs and women or women and vagina CEOs, because if you have a vagina, I don't care what you identify as, you need to know how to take care of it because it impacts so many different areas of our life, our relationships, our mental health, you know, pregnancy and postpartum, all of that. So it's definitely an area where I want people to feel included. Absolutely. I don't think you know, women and just everyone in this world talk about it enough. I mean, there was so much 
you know, maturing in the teenage years and then getting into adulthood, there was so much I didn't know about my own body. And I yeah. think that's alarming. I feel like I had a decent education. Yeah. From school, you know? Yeah. The, I was just uh, talking about this the other day. Um, three things that were told like as young girls about intercourse and sex, that's just not true. Um, I think part of the issue is that not only is there a lack of quality education, we're also miseducated. We're told things that are not true. We're told things that are not complete in nature, like we only get a, a part of the story. And so we grow up with these myths, you know, myths like sex should be painful the first few times, which is which is false. It should not be painful. And that prepares us for ideologies that say that sex is going to be uncomfortable. And then, so we prepare people, people to suffer through pain because we've told them that it's normal. And we've, we've told, you know, women and people that your vagina is supposed to be extremely tight. So then now when it is extremely tight, you actually think that's a good thing. And you don't know that's contributing to constipation, peeing all the time, you know, UTI symptoms when you don't have a UTI. I mean, it's just so many different things that we've been miseducated on. And that's one of my goals is to provide the truth and to provide good quality education to help us live the life that we deserve. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like two things that just pop up for me, having like stomach problems and having to pee a lot, I just feel like is normalized now. I feel like everyone thinks that that's normal. Totally, which is the furthest thing from the truth. And, and we've trained our brains too. It's not even just pelvic floor in the bladder. It's also your brain. Your brain is so used to you paying that often that it will tell you to go pee when there's hardly nothing in your bladder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there will be hardly nothing in your bladder and you can literally feel like you're not going to make it to the bathroom if you go past that typical time frame that you've trained yourself to pee. So it's a combination of things like anxiety, you know, just the way we trained ourselves. And of course, you know, bladder dysfunction and pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. Mm -hmm. How yeah. can, how does anxiety tie into like frequency and urgency and all of that? So when you have anxiety, your nervous system is in a heightened state. So that can mean that something that should not typically hurt, it feels more sensitive or painful. Like people with interstitial cystitis, many of them have painful intercourse. And so if a penis or a sex toy or a finger is going into the vagina, most of the time we'll just feel like pressure, like a very mild stretch. But if the nerves are really sensitive because the whole nervous system is in a heightened state of emergency or you know, just preparing you to, to run, <laughs> That's what anxiety is. Your body is literally having you constantly be prepared to just make a run for it. But there's, but you never start running. <laughs> so your body is in this constant state of emergency. And so that can make the nerves that feed the bladder overactive. So you get a little bit of uh, urine in your bladder, but your, your brain is like, oh, we got to get this out because we got to prepare to run. Go pee again. And so it's, it's the brain, but then it's also the nerves that are driving the bladder to behave that way. And then also when we have anxiety, the pelvic floor muscles that surround and support the bladder, they get tense and tight. So if you have pressure, you know, exerting itself on the bladder from those tense and guarded pelvic floor muscles, then that can feel like pressure on your bladder, which feels like an urge to, to urinate. So it can be a combination of things, but anxiety for sure is one of the driving factors for um, bladder dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been noticing that in my clients is there's so many people that come to me and they think that diet is usually the 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 biggest trigger for people. That's how they come in thinking that diet is their biggest thing. And we usually find out that diet either isn't an issue at all, or they're only sensitive to two or three things yeah. diet wise. And usually there is an element of, you know, nervous system dysfunction, or maybe it's a little bit of that and it's hormone related or something related to allergies or pelvic floor, you know, it's just so complex that I think it's important to talk about these things, especially highlighting the nervous system. Absolutely. It's, it's complex and it's layered. It's like an onion. You know, you can put peel back that first layer and we think, okay, just drink enough water and don't drink wine and we'll be good. And, and it's like, 
well, that was one layer. Good job. But now we have the other layers. <laughs> so I completely agree. It's complex. And that's why. And I feel like that's where professionals like yourself and myself come in, where we can sort of give someone a different perspective and say, hey, actually, we need to look at these things um, that could be contributing to why you're suffering and why you're going through what you are. Absolutely. And I think, honestly, we as a whole system, like need to do a better job of working together instead of just working in like a one person unit and acting more as like an interdisciplinary team for each individual patient. Because, you know, if you address diet on its own and you address your pelvic floor on its own, you, you could be missing certain pieces of that puzzle. Absolutely. I think there definitely needs to be more camaraderie among healthcare professionals, especially when we know it's dependent on those other things. You know, even as a pelvic floor physical therapist, there's no way that I can treat someone with sexual dysfunction, urinary incontinence, or interstitial cystitis, um, you know, bowel dysfunction, and not discuss food. But then when I start talking about food, there's only so far I can go because I am not a dietitian. I'm not a nutritionist. So I, I agree. I think that that is so good. We need to start thinking of how can we streamline that? Like, how can we make it so easy for the clients we interact with to find those other people that can help propel them forward a little bit quicker because people need help fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, I'm not a believer that like, it takes three, four, five years to start feeling better. Now it can because of just so many different factors, but I think with certain uh, preparations, like you said, being collaborative with other healthcare practitioners and obviously get in just seeing a good practitioner period, <laughs> like seeing people who know what they're doing, um, that, can, that can streamline the process. Unfortunately, there's more barriers though. Not everyone has access to great practitioners not everyone knows what the pelvic floor is um there's so many there's so many barriers and that's where this educational piece comes into play like this is a free podcast i mean you listen to the podcast and you learn <laughs> so i think you know different resources like this are doing so good for the community especially for people with ic yeah absolutely it's it's not going to be a quick journey usually to get relief i mean i've had these symptoms my whole life and i didn't get relief until i was like 24 it yeah. took me that long and yeah. there was a mix of reasons as to why that happened but part of what you were saying i i had a bunch of practitioners that didn't know what they were doing or kind of pressured me into invasive procedures which i don't respond well to yeah I'm I'm a very sensitive person and procedures or treatments like installations or hydrodistensions were just too invasive for me. Yeah. And would trigger a flare in itself. Yeah. So, you know, it, it it really just is such an individualized thing. And I think the difficult part is that when you are new to this condition, to interstitial cystitis, it's hard to know how to sift through and identify the better practitioners and the not so great practitioners yeah totally and I mean and that's that's difficult um it's hard to do that like there's no there's no answer on like here here's a list of bad practitioners and here's a list of the good ones and here are the good ones of the goodest ones I know that's not a word so there's <laughs> like there's so many barriers and and it, and it won't always be easy but there's also like, I like to also tell the truth on my Instagram and my platform. Like if you're working with a practitioner for, at least for physical therapy, for pelvic floor dysfunction. I mean, I've heard of people going to see their pelvic floor therapist for like two, three years, even one year. And there's no change. I'm not talking about, okay, you've gotten a lot better and you're sort of plateauing. There's like no significant change. And it's like, no, you need to go see someone else. You need to go try a different option. You need to stop going to see them. It's, it's nothing, it's saying nothing about them. They're, they're, you guys are just not a match at this time. Go see someone else. So I, I think it can be complicated and the journey can be continual. Like the journey is for a lot of people, it's lifelong. But then at the same time, like when you're investing a lot of your time, money, effort into one thing and it's not working, feel feel good to pivot. Feel like, Feel courageous to pivot and turn directions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a siren right now I don't know if you can hear I cannot that. hear it you are good oh okay 
I, I think it's empowering to do that. I think taking control of your, I don't know, I see destiny, how corny is that? But I think that that is really empowering and just having the courage to do that is really awesome. And I've, it's funny that you said that I've actually seen four different physical therapists for IC in the past 10 years. And every practitioner was so different. And yeah. I think, like you said, if you're not vibing or if you're not a good match for each other, then just find someone else. So that being said, it's kind of hard right now to see a new practitioner in a decent amount of time. I mean, wait lists right. are out like three, four months, at least near me. Totally. Is there a shortage of pelvic PTs? Yes, absolutely. Pelvic floor PTs, um, very much a shortage. And also it's just, it's a pandemic of pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm -hmm. There's what's happening is the online world is exposing the pelvic floor dysfunction that we've lived with for years and made jokes about it or didn't even realize that it was the pelvic floor. So there's this like, oh my gosh, that's me. I have a problem. I can get help. And then there's the side of, you know, just creating more pelvic floor physical therapists. And right now we cannot keep up with that demand. So there is a shortage. I mean, even, even virtually, I don't even see people in person and I still have a wait list just for myself. So it's, it's difficult. And there is a, there is some patience that will be required especially if you're just going to pivot like, Hey, I'm done with you as a pelvic floor therapist. Yeah. You're going to have to wait a while. Um, but I, I rather spend some time focusing on other things like, like diet and sleep and your nervous system and just movement for those two, three months while you wait, as opposed to going to someone for an hour every week and they're not really helping you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of wasting your time, maybe yeah. pivoting and, and finding things that work better for you at that point in time. Right, exactly. So what is the process? Can can you kind of take us through the process of, okay, you have a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis. What should be happening in terms of getting someone to public for PT? Are you talking about the referral process? I guess the referral process. And is it appropriate for a doctor to refer everyone with IC to PT? Yes, everyone should be going to pelvic floor physical therapy. Most people with IC have nothing actually wrong with their bladder. There's, if you, if you do imaging and you look at the bladder, there's not going to be like, oh, you have a bladder disease. IC is a title, interstitial cystitis. I mean, obviously this, the name means inflammatory bladder, right? But in terms of imaging and the physiological makeup of the bladder, it's not any different from someone else if you look on imaging. So everyone should be going. It doesn't mean everyone's going to get better from pelvic floor physical therapy, but it's like, that's the easiest, most non-invasive method. It's like, you have nothing to lose. So unfortunately though, there, there are not enough educated medical doctors who either know about the evidence behind pelvic floor physical therapy for interstitial cystitis, or they don't believe in it, Right. And so while it may not be this magic cure that's going to get you better in three months, it's definitely things that you need to learn about your pelvic floor, about how your bladder communicates with your pelvic muscles, all of that, that should be, I believe, included on the journey of everyone that has interstitial cystitis. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't need a referral anymore. So we're, really? yeah, we're, we're direct practitioners. I didn't that know that. that. We have first access now. So go straight to a pelvic floor physical therapist. That is news to me, but that's great. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you won't eventually need your doctor to sign on, but to get in the door with a pelvic floor physical therapist, we do have direct access now. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they made physical therapists get their doctorates because they wanted us to be first line treatment. We, they, they didn't want this whole waiting process and your doctor has to approve and it, that's irrelevant now. So yeah, go, I have a directory on my page, vaginarehabdoctor.com, where I have a directory of uh, minority pelvic floor therapists. And there's so many other directories and obviously Google. Um, and so you can go straight, find your, 
find your own quote unquote vagina rehab doctor. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I thought something that might be preventing people from making an appointment with a pelvic floor PT is just the idea of what it is and what, what their brain is telling them, like, this is what it's going to look like, or they just don't know what the process is going to look like. And I think that prevents a lot of people from actually making that appointment. I can speak from personal experience when my doctor initially told me that she sent a referral to go to pelvic floor PT 10 years ago, and they called me to schedule the appointment. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to schedule that right now. And I just absolutely blew it off because I didn't understand how that could help me. Nobody explained it to me. Okay. So I know you're asking me the questions, but I I want to (laughs) understand. Please ask. I want to understand from the patient perspective of someone who has IC. I understand completely there's discomfort with that, but I want to know what exactly are you uncomfortable with? Like, what are some of the thoughts going through your head? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, what I'm going to say, I guess, is coming from my road to remission clients and we have two support calls each week. So we kind of all just talk openly about it. And when people have an appointment coming up, they're like, I'm really nervous. Like, are they going to do internal work right away? Like, is that awkward? I think it's more of that awkward, uncomfortable feeling of another human putting their hand in your body. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I think number one, just establishing that it is not going to be a pleasure field situation, right? That you're not going to have an orgasm in there, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is going to be somewhat uncomfortable, but it does not have to be, it doesn't have to be a bad situation. I honestly don't think it's any worse than seeing the gynecologist, Mm -hmm. right? So when you go get a pap smear, they're still putting something in your vagina. However, when you go see a pelvic floor physical therapist, it's not a tool. It's not this cold metal big thing that they're shoving up your vagina. It's a glove finger. So Mm -hmm. it's actually going to be more comfortable. I think it's the, I think education, a lack of not knowing what's going to happen is creating a lot of the distance and the discomfort with it. So just knowing that when you go see a pelvic floor physical therapist, most of the time you're just going to be talking (laughs) for the first 30 minutes. They will, they most likely will not even touch you. Mm -hmm. We need to understand your story. We need to understand your history. We need to understand things about your gut, you know, your behaviors. And then when we get to the physical exam, um, it should include other things too, like looking at your range of motion, your hip strength, your back, your posture. We can't get to everything in one session. So if your therapist doesn't do all of that on the first session, it's okay. In terms of the pelvic floor exam, that can be external and internal, okay? So we can get a lot of information just from looking at your pelvic floor, right? And of course, we do need to have your clothes off for that from a visual standpoint. But then even if we didn't want to look, just feeling the pelvic floor muscles from the outside of your clothes can give us some information. Now, if we want to get the most information about your pelvic floor, internal pelvic floor muscle exam is necessary. And the reason why is because the pelvic floor muscles are on the inside of the pelvis. It's like the bowl holding up all of the internal pelvic organs, bladder, rectum, uterus, and vagina. So to get to those muscles, to feel how are, how are they interacting when you breathe? What do they do? We need to feel how do they contract? Do they relax completely? We need to feel, are there any trigger points, like specific areas that are sensitive and tender and cause shooting pain and all these different things? We get the most information from the internal, but it's one glove finger. And honestly, we're going to be communicating with you. We need to know, are you uncomfortable during this time? We need to know, and we should be asking you, is it okay for me to insert my finger? I'm going to press here. Let me know if there's pain. That internal portion should take more, no more than about 10 to 15 minutes. And that should be it for the first day. You can even postpone that first initial internal exam. You can say, hey, I'm still warming up to the idea of this. Can we postpone it to the next session? Mm-hmm. And so you do have options. But honestly, you're going to be so excited when you learn about your pelvic floor personality. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, it's been angry this whole time. 
And, and that is that is the common thread for IC, that there's so much myofascial, meaning fascia, muscle, nerves, and ligaments that are just not happy for a right. variety of different reasons. And so the more information we get about that, the more help and more understanding you're going to have to help you feel better. Mm -hmm. I think another concern people have is that it's going to be painful, especially if you're someone who deals with blood or pain on a daily basis. It's like, why would I have someone put their hand in me and, you know, work on that area? Isn't that going to just exacerbate my symptoms? Yeah, that's a good question too. So the actual pelvic floor exam shouldn't be painful in and of itself. A part of the exam might be uncomfortable. I will say like when you're pressing to see, hey, does this muscle feel tender? Then that part is not going to feel great. And the whole thing is honestly going to be likely uncomfortable the same way it's uncomfortable when you go to the, the gynae, when you go to the gynecologist. But it shouldn't be like excruciating, like, oh my gosh, this hurts. That should not be happening. And if it is just, you need to, you know, let them know, I need you to stop or I need you to apply less pressure. Or, you know, I'm in a lot of pain. But there should not be any um, severe or even moderate. It should be a mild discomfort and maybe mild pain only if they're pressing on areas to try and elicit the problem. We do need to figure out what's driving your symptoms, right? So we do, we do need to know, can we reproduce your problem? And that's actually most helpful. We can reproduce the problem in the session because then we know how to treat it if we can find the place of the problem and why it's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great explanation of that process. And, you know, something that was really helpful for me in feeling more comfortable in going to PT was just seeing an actual like 3D model of the pelvic floor and just looking at the muscles. I think it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it totally is. It's so cool. The pelvic floor is like, <laughs> One of the coolest, most diverse, well-rounded, sexiest muscles in the entire body, but also sensitive and emotional. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, really cool muscle group. They really needed to start teaching this to everyone in school. Yeah, I agree. I, I think every doctor, anyone who's dealing with women's health and also male pelvic health, not just women. Anyone with a pelvis that's coming with pelvic problems, knowing about the pelvic floor can completely change the way you treat and also completely change your clients and your patient's life in a matter of a few weeks for some people, obviously not for everyone, but sometimes it's just minor changes that can be so helpful. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure that for men, it, it could even be even more nerve wracking to go to pelvic floor PT because they don't have a vagina and you know, that, that process looks a little bit different for them, right? It does look different for them, but actually they come a little bit sooner. I think they want to get, they want to get better. They want to have an erection. <laughs> they want, <laughs> they want to have sex without pain. They're not, they're not fooling <laughs> around here. Women and people with vaginas, we've been told to settle. We've been told pain is normal. We're ashamed to talk about it. We're hiding our pads. We don't want to talk about our periods. So it's a lot of shame with women and you know people who who have a vagina. For men, I, I think they're like, listen, do whatever you got to do. Put your finger in my butthole. Do, <laughs> do whatever necessary. And that's what we have to do. They have a pelvic floor. They just don't have a vagina. We go through the anus. It's, it's very similar process. We just move their balls out of the way, <laughs> their <laughs> testicles. We do have them get like a sheet and wrap their testicles under the sheet and then lift their, their penis and their balls out of the way. So things are not just hanging while we're got you know, it. their pelvic floor. Cause you know, that's awkward. So we, we get that out of the way, <laughs> uh, -huh. uh, but the pelvic floor is right there. It's so similar. They, they deal with many of the same things. They can have painful intercourse prolapse, urinary incontinence, urinary frequency, erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I'm, <laughs> you made me visualize it and now I'm just giggling. <laughs> For kids, ah, yeah, teenage girl. <laughs> yeah, it's, they, they don't, I mean, we want to get better too. And I don't want to make yeah. it seem that we don't want to get better. We do. I think we have a little bit more, uh, endurance like we we will deal with these problems a little bit longer before we, we even feel comfortable talking about it or like telling people about it and also it's just 
we've been um, we've been disregarded for so many years, or maybe we've seen a practitioner and they just did not take it seriously. Like we also have lost some faith. Like we, some of us just don't believe that there's hope. So I think there's so many different layers involved. But yeah, men men can come, women can come, all genders are welcome. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, random question that just popped in into my mind that I know the answer to, but I want to ask it to give everyone else the answer. So can um, a woman come in and get internal work if she's on her period? So absolutely. And I, so I try not to push my internal beliefs or like my personality on everyone. Cause I'm like, I, I want to get people better so much quicker. I'm like, who cares? Like, Right. It's literally, not, it's like 90% water. It's just red. Okay. So let, let, as long as you're not cramping in a lot of pain, I tell my clients and my patients, if you feel comfortable, we can move on. Especially in person, we have the chucks, like the linings that go down for all bodily fluids, not just blood, all right? Discharge, urine, sweat, you know, blood is just another form of bodily fluids. But if they are uncomfortable and they don't want to do it, you know, I, I'm not going to like push someone, but I do need them to know that we can keep moving. We can keep the process going. A lot of people feel like they lose progress because they didn't do anything for like a week. And then when they go back, they're like, oh, I feel like I'm starting all over. So that is an option. If you don't want to wait, you don't have to. Um, you can see a therapist while you're on your period and you can also do your internal or your dilating or your wanding obviously your stretches and breathing um while you're on your menstrual cycle Mm -hmm. yeah and i I think a lot of excuse me while you're on your period i had to correct that (laughs) yeah i think a lot of people didn't know that or at least they're confused about it so i'm glad that we cleared that up yeah um so i guess my next question is what does the is there one uniform protocol for for physical therapy for interstitial cystitis or does it depend on the practitioner or does it depend on each individual? Um, I think a little bit of that, but definitely it, each practitioner is different. So like you said, you saw four pelvic floor physical therapists and they were all vastly different. So no one is going to treat the exact same way. However, we should all have pretty much the same goals. Like if you come to me with IC and you're peeing every 10 minutes and every time you have sex, it feels like you have a UTI and it's burning and you you, you can't have any soda and it, you know, all these different things, then I'm going to want to get you to the point where you can wait at least two or three hours before you go pee. I want you to have sex without pain. So the goals, the functional goals, I think should be similar. And even the interventions are going to be similar. Um, there's only there's only so many different things we can do. So manual therapy will likely be a big part of it, right? And not just inside the pelvic floor, there's the abdominal wall, your abs. If you're in pain a lot, you're going to be clenching. When you're in pain, you're guarding, you curl up in a ball, you clench not just your pelvic floor, but your butt cheeks, you're sucking in your tummy. So there's restrictions that have developed, not just in the abdominal wall, but in the hips in the butt, in the inner thighs. There's so many areas. So that's going to be a component, definitely behavioral and, um, you know, just daily adaptation. So sort of an introduction into what you would go more in depth about. So we're going to go over bladder irritants and all of that. But then also what are, what are those like biomechanical and postural deformities or deficits that are making it easier for your pelvic floor to piss your bladder off? You know, what, is there something going on with your shoulders? Are you sort of rounded? Is your posture always round? Is your butt tucked under? Are you always <laughs> over arched, right? There's so Sorry. many different things. No problem. There's so many different things that can be making it very easy for your pelvic floor to create chaos for your bladder. Um, anxiety, stress management, breathing, that's going to be a big part of it. But a lot of down training, relax the muscles, relax the, 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 the bladder, relax. When I say relax the bladder, relax the way it behaves. Um, relax your nervous system and the way you think. There's also something regarding um, a history of sexual trauma that, that is a piece that a lot of people don't discuss. With people who have IC, there is a significantly um, higher rate of sexual abuse 
um, for people who have IC. It, it doesn't mean if you have IC, you've been abused, but it does mean that if you look at women who do not have IC and then you look at women who have it, there are much higher rates of women who have experienced sexual trauma in their past. So there's definitely a piece of like the psychological, the psychosocial that is driving some of that hyperactivity in the pelvis. For sure. Yeah. There's, like you said, so many different layers. And every time we say layers, I think of that scene in Shrek where Shrek says, onions have layers. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about, but that sounds extremely hilarious. <laughs> oh my God. Have you seen that movie? No. Oh, what okay. You're probably the movie? Shrek. Oh, okay. No, I think I have seen Shrek. Okay. But here's the thing about me. I'm weird. When Ever since I was a little girl, my friends would love movies like that. Shrek and like Avatar and like Space Jam. Anything that cannot happen in real life, I fell asleep in those mo- in those movies. I don't know why. It's like my brain was saying, Janelle, this is fake. Please get some sleep while you can. <laughs> and I just, even, even today, I'll go to a movie and I might fall asleep during. If it's, if it's like a story that could potentially happen in real life or it's a romantic comedy or something, I love those movies. So yeah, I don't even remember what happened in Shrek. Dang it, Janelle. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to shoot my shot here because everybody's seen Shrek. But nope, apparently not. <laughs> oh, not well, I've seen it, but it, listen, I don't remember what happened, unfortunately. Well, let's just hope everyone listening, or at least the majority, know the, the line that I'm talking about. The way you said it was funny, the way you said it. <laughs> like, there's layers. Oh my God, I'm a little embarrassed. Now I have to go watch it now. Yes, you do. You yeah. really do. Um, so is there a is there a recommended frequency in how many times you need to go to pelvic floor PT to get results? Um, what's the duration between visits? Like, what does that look like? So whew, with IC, there's so many different levels of severity. So if yours is pretty severe, meaning, you know, your whole life is in shambles, right? Everything is impacted. Then it's going to take you a little bit longer, right? Even if the therapist is good. Um, I remember seeing someone uh, a couple of years ago with IC. She was peeing like every five minutes, um, lots of burning, lots of pelvic pain. Um, and she did have a history of sexual trauma. I think I saw her for a good three or four months. It doesn't mean it took her that long to get better, but we were working together, I believe one or two times a week for an hour. And I saw her for at least three or four months. And by the end, she was she was sexually active, Um she was waiting two to three hours before she went to go pee. Um, she was like sitting through movies because that was a big thing for her. She's like, oh my gosh, I went to the movie. I didn't have to get up. She's like, I went to the concert and I had a good time. I didn't even think about my bladder. I was like, yes. That's so huge. yeah, it, it varies. I would say you, you can start seeing improvement in maybe six sessions, maybe even sooner. But like for a good amount of improvement, it's probably going to take two to four months at least. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're probably going to give people homework, right? I mean, I know my PTs have given me like dilator or wand work to do in between sessions. Absolutely. Yeah. If you only do stuff with me in the session, it's going to take you forever to get better or you may not even notice anything significant. You have to do something at home. I think that's why... So I shifted to doing virtual care in um, November of last year of 2022. Before that, it was all in person, working at a hospital, clinics. I don't even see my clients now at all. That means I don't touch them. I don't put one finger on them. And my clients are getting better quicker. And I think it's because there's so much more emphasis on what they're going to be doing because I'm not touching them at all, that they are so much more consistent. And... I'm guiding them on what to do to themselves when I am with them. So when you work with someone in person, again, I still think this is the gold standard. If you can find someone in person, that's great. But in person, it's more about what I'm doing to your body. I'm putting my finger in your vagina. I'm looking at your pelvis. I'm looking at your posture. But virtually, I'm, I have the, their camera off if we're working on any area that is intimate. The camera is off. And I'm telling them what to do to their own body. So there is a different level of empowerment. And so I think that it's different. Uh, There's so many different avenues. There's so many different routes. 
but definitely two two to four months. I mean, I think there should be a very good amount of improvement. You may not feel perfect, but you should you should feel like, wow, I, I noticed a, a big difference. Yeah. No, that's such a good point that, you know, I've never felt confident in doing the stuff on my own because like you're saying, my therapist has been doing all of the work for me. Yeah. Like, yeah, I can do my stretches at home, but when it comes to, you know, wand work, dilator work, there's, there's been a lot of confusion, at least for me and just not feeling confident. And I feel like if I were to be, you know, talked through it, yeah, maybe I would learn it a lot better and a lot quicker. Yeah. And also, I mean, it's not just, it's a learning curve for me because I'm so used to doing most of the work. I'm so used to having my hands on their spine, finding the tight area in their pelvic floor. I wasn't even considering the ways in which I could just empower my clients to do that. But now for me, it started when via Instagram, I started getting messages from people like, hey, I'm feeling better just from your Instagram videos. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what you, I mean, people are like overcoming pain and vaginismus and urinary incontinence and frequent urination. So I was like starting to believe more in virtual care. I was like, okay, because at first I was not a believer. I'm like, how, how is this going to work? Like, I need to touch your body. This is a physical career. When I started getting those messages, I just started doing exercise classes. And then I realized, wait a minute, the same thing I do to their body in the session, I could just teach them to do their own body. There's so many tools now. The q I mean, even the Q-tip test, I'm sure you've got a little Q-tip test. Do that to yourself, <laughs> reassess yourself, dilators, wands, even your own finger. The sky is the limit. And I, I do think, you know, I, I love it if everyone could have their own in-person therapist, but the reality is number one, not all of us can access one. Some of us live in Chattahoochee and there's no pelvic floor. <laughs> the, the next pelvic floor therapist is 50 miles away, you know, or you just don't feel comfortable with that. That's the other thing. Like I can explain it all I want. I don't know your background. I don't know what you've been through. And if you don't want to go through that, that could be a potential barrier to you getting better. So there's so many routes, there's virtual care, there's in-person, obviously there's education from different things like this, podcasts and social media. Um, so just don't give up, don't give up on the journey, no matter how long it's taking, especially for IC. There's so much evidence showing that pelvic floor physical therapy and other routes of care, like um, learning about your nutrition and your diet have so much to do with your recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It there needs to be a holistic approach for sure. Yeah. Um, I had a question and of course it escaped my brain. Let's talk I have about a question. <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead. So with the four different pelvic floor physical therapists, did you feel like one actually helped you to sort of achieve a level that you can be happy with? Um, to be completely honest with you, no, none of them have. None okay. of them have contributed in a way like they were great, but they didn't get me to get significant relief. Like, and, you know, the first one was really focused on building up my core. And, you know, I, I kind of my pelvis tilts forward and my butt sticks out a lot. And so I had to work on kind of straightening that out a little bit. So we did a lot of that with her. The second one just did a lot of internal work. The third one did a lot of stretching, um, some out, uh, external work. And then the one that I see right now, um, her name is Karen Snowden. She's great. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but I think she teaches a lot of physical therapists and she's great. She does a lot of internal work, um, but it is really difficult to get in to see her just because of the demand in our area. And I will take some accountability for my lack of progress because I'm not always consistent with yeah. the outside work that I need to be doing, the the wand work. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's real. That that is the honest truth. And I wanted to 
I didn't want to just only talk about the solution when there's someone like yourself sitting, <laughs> you know, you're right here. Let's, let's hear from you. So absolutely. I'm, I'm more than happy to share my journey and my struggles. I mean, first 25 years of my life were not great at all. It was, you know, peeing fire every single time I went to the point where I thought it was normal. And so, you know, now that I'm pretty much pain-free, I always say like 95% pain-free. I mean, the biggest thing for me to get to that point was working on my nervous system because I am stuck in that. What did you call it in the beginning? Emergency state? Yeah. Your your nervous system is just in a heightened state. And yeah. one, one thing I noticed about your story, obviously, I don't know everything about you, but you said you had it from a young age. So ever since I, mean, I can remember, ever since you can remember. So for me, that lets me know that something was going on in your childhood that led to your pelvic floor being like tr- in protective mode. And it can be different. It doesn't have to be anything like, wow, she went through this. Re-. It can be literally just getting bullied at school. It mm-hmm. could be the most simple things that led your body to feel like we have to close off and contract and protect this pelvic floor, you know? So, I mean, just learning that alone, I I know as physical therapists, we're big on manuals and the pelvis and all of that, but it's also just retraining the brain and the brain, of course, is the nervous system. Like how can we make your brain think and believe that you actually do not have to go pee right now Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that these nerves do not have anything to protect you from because it truly believes that these things are dangerous, right? How can we get them to know that it's actually not? So I'm glad that you said that. And just for everyone listening, the pelvis and the pelvic floor is important. Yes, that's a good part of it. But there's also like, how can we retrain the way your brain and your thoughts are behaving? And, you know, those thoughts that are going through your head and also just um, how anxious you feel on a daily basis, how tense and how, um, how heightened your nervous system is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why I'm really glad that Evelyn Hecht started that pelvic sense program. Um, she's really been helping a lot of people. I don't know if you're familiar with her or that program, but she's a pelvic floor PT who created a, you know, uh, I think it's a biopsychosocial program that helps to rewire the brain and, you know, I've heard really good things about it. So that's just one tool that people could use to, to work on that. Well, yeah, I never heard of it. What did you say the name of it was? called Pelvic Sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can send you a link later, but it's really cool. Yeah. Another thing that I went through in my journey was I had a, I had no frequency ever growing up, just the pain. And then I had a hydrodistension. And after that, couldn't go 20 minutes without peeing it was incredible like the change that happened and it was horrible because it was when I was a freshman in college and I was sharing a room and I was so embarrassed about this my poor roommate probably didn't get any sleep but the thing that helped me and this is something really significant that my third physical therapist helped me with was bladder retraining yes training I don't know the correct term that's it But that was, that was the thing that really got rid of that for me. It took me maybe six months to get through that. But is that something that you can explain for the audience? Sure. Yeah. So bladder retraining is essentially getting your brain to store new memories about when it's time for you to pee. So whenever we, whenever we do an action, anything, whether it's biting into an apple or punching someone in the face, that, that gets stored in our brain. And so if we, for a few months or even a few years, go pee in like 30 minute increments, there are muscular contributor, to contributors to that and like your bladder and all that. But your brain is probably the biggest contributing factor if you're just peeing a lot, like frequently, and it's not in harmony with how much fluid you're drinking. I mean, you're not guzzling tons and tons of water, so you should not be peeing more than every two hours. And so what we do is, is with bladder training and pelvic floor therapy is if you're pe- peeing every 30 minutes, what we do is at that 30 minute mark, you don't just rush and get up and go to the bathroom. You're probably going to stay seated. You might do some diaphragmatic breathing or mental distraction. Get on your phone and play like a game that requires thinking. And let's see if we can stretch it out to about five to 10 more minutes and get you to try and go pee every 
40 minutes for like a week. And then after a week, let's do 45 to 50 minutes. And then that's the thing. But during that time, when you get that urge to pee, you're going to ride the wave. And so the, the urge to pee comes in waves. If you ignore it for long enough, it literally goes away. The same thing with being hungry. That's another bodily urge. If you in, in, ignore your hunger for long enough, the, the sense of being hungry will go away. Same thing with sexual desire and getting sleepy and all of that. It can go away temporarily. So what we want to do is during that time when we know it's inappropriate for you to go pee again, we want to distract your brain. Have you sit down. If you're standing, it's going to be hard to try and distract yourself. Sit down so that your pelvic floor muscles get that tactile stimulation from the chair. That's going to calm your bladder. And then let's mentally distract you. Let's have you start doing some breathing. Let's have you create a grocery list. Let's have you count down backwards from like 100 by sevens. That requires a lot of thinking. And then before you know it, the urge is gone. And then you can wait about 10 to 15 more minutes. And you just keep doing that until you get to a, a frequency that's more normal or, or more common, which is about every two to two to four hours. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask that, like, what is normal? So every two to four hours, how many times per day is that? Uh, it's about seven to nine times. Okay. Is it normal so, to get up at all at night? So if you are under the age of like 70 years old, we do not expect you to be um, getting up more than once, preferably none. Okay. So if you're getting up two, three, four, then of course we want to work on that. Um, some of the same strategies can be used, but one of the biggest is just stop drinking stuff two to three hours before bed. That's like the biggest one. And then of course your nervous system. <laughs> I know we keep going back to that, but a lot of people get the frequent urination at night right before bed. Right? So there's some anxiety. There's like, oh, I don't want to pee during the night. So like you're getting nervous and then you have the frequent peeing right before. So it's your brain and your pelvic floor and your vagina. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago, like I, I couldn't fall asleep if I felt just one drop of urine in my bladder. Like I could not not think about it and I would that's why I got up so many times yeah yeah there's there's so many things at play I mean so with IC it's bi-directional we say that things like anxiety sexual trauma um, of course depression can drive some bladder dysfunction but also just having a painful bladder will make you more anxious <laughs> you're, you're of course you're going to be guarded you're going to be like oh why do I feel like this that's going to be heightening your nervous system too, just simply being in that amount of pain and discomfort. So there's two directions that we want to treat. We want to treat the system like in terms of just how calm you feel on a daily basis, your breathing, your thoughts, but then also we want to treat the physical stuff. So that's like your pelvis and your butt and your breathing and your ribs and, you know, mm -hmm. even yeah. your butthole, your butthole. <laughs> Even Those butthole, butthole muscles are so tight. Oh my gosh. Like, especially <laughs> for people with IC, that butt is tight. Oh my gosh. They say oh uptight. They, this is literally uptight ass, like literally. You say literally. Like you're an uptight ass. No, literally, you are. <laughs> Oh my God. Hilarious. Well, that is a perfect topic to end on. <laughs> Why don't we just wrap it up with that? <laughs> my God. Oh my gosh. This has been really thoroughly entertaining and also educational. So I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Um, thank you so much, Janelle, for coming on and talking with me for like 60 minutes about pelvic floors and buttholes. <laughs> Absolutely. If you guys are worried about your butthole or worried about your bladder, keep listening because you, you mean you've given so much helpful information, even for me as a pelvic floor therapist, I learned some stuff from you today, Callie. So oh. I am so uh, excited to like, just learn more from another uh, standpoint. Like it's not just the pelvic floor. So I'm excited about what I've learned. And for those of you who want to know more from me, you can learn more about your butthole and your bladder on my Instagram page, vagina rehab doctor. <laughs> and TikTok. <laughs> oh yeah you know what i i'm very much encouraged i didn't think i was a tiktok queen but yes i am are. here so come find me whether you want to be or not you are oh that's so sweet thank you okay 